Um, okay, so this series that you're hosting is um, at the Lighthouse is imperative. It's not only for our minds, but also for our souls. Um, I like to say that history is a lot of theology and psychology, right? It's the story of humanity with the divine, and then the story of humanity um, with itself, like amongst themselves. Um, it's important also to know your own history. It's important to know your own story, where you come from. Socrates tells us, uh, know thyself, right? Know your true nature as an immortal soul, right? Know yourself in your community, know yourself in relation to the divine. Studying our history helps us get to that point. Um, and then, it, like, once you know yourself, you're able to, you know, outpour, get to know other people. Um, and get to know them well. So a lot of us in this community absorb our communal narrative and memory from growing up in Sunday school. And then once we graduate, we begin to read the community's history, which proves to be a challenge because, um, especially for the century that we're gonna focus on today, solid critical sources written from within the tradition, within the community are few and far between. The more readily available sources are written by people who are observing the tradition from without, um, and they ultimately don't understand the tradition the way that you and I would. Um, I also advocate weaving church history back into the larger picture, what is going on in the world. Um, I shared that last time. I think I maybe focused a little bit too much on that last time, so I'm going to try to remedy that this time. Um, and so we are going to, um, again, start with what is going on in the world uh, in the 20th century. And then we're gonna observe what is happening in the region, uh, the Middle East. Um, and then after that, we're gonna look at what happens uh, in Egypt with the Copts and the Coptic church. Uh, I'm also, when we get to the, the part about Egypt, our last bit, I'm gonna start off by talking about Pope Cyril IV the um, the father of reform, as he's called. He's patriarch from 1854 to 1861. I'm going to talk about him a little bit because he's a monumental figure and I didn't give him his proper due last time. So if we could switch to the first slide, please. Um, the, the 20th century is marked by war, I would say, for 54 years out of the century, war is going on. The First World War starts in 1914, ends in 1918. It starts with the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo, and that sparks the quote-unquote war to end all wars. Um, World War I marks the first use of fully automatic weapons that fire bullets rapidly. Um, before this war ends, we have um, a revolution in Russia in 1917, the Russian czars overthrown by the Bolsheviks, and that sparks lots of communist uh, revolutions all over Europe. When World War I ends the following year, so we're at 1918, much of the map of Europe is redrawn uh, by the victors of the war um, based on the theory that future wars could be prevented if all ethnic groups had their own quote unquote homeland. So here we have an uh, understanding of nationalism and how that affects uh, territories and how people are ruled. Uh, so we have new states like Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia, which no longer exist. Um, these states were created out of the former Austro-Hungarian Austro empire to accommodate the nationalist aspirations of these groups. And then following, again, World War I, we have an international body called the League of Nations. Um, it's formed in 1920, and it's formed with the express purpose to mediate disputes and prevent future wars. Now, nine years later, so we're at 1929, the stock market crashes and the Great Depression is ushered in. And a lot of people then seek solutions to their economic problems by turning to ideologies like communism and fascism. And they start to vote in uh, fascist leaders. 
The first fascist leader that is voted in is Mussolini in Italy in 1922, um, and then Hitler in Germany 11 years later. So that has us at 1933. Hitler starts the Second World War on September 1st, 1939 um, by invading Poland. And the Second World War lasts until 1945. There are a lot of things that happened in the world that altered the course of history um, and just how fellow humans treat each other from World War, World Wars One and Two. Um, the world knows a little bit more about World War II um, simply because of resources, which we'll get to. We all know about the Holocaust, right? Where six million Jews uh, were, um, six million Jews lost their lives and at least another five million more uh, quote unquote undesirables of society uh, were killed by various means. Um, we know about the concentration camps, we know about the gas chambers, we know about uh, ghettos. Um, recall how also in our last lecture, um, the ideas of the theory of evolution and the study of eugenics is introduced in the previous centuries, previous two centuries. World War II also brings about the first use of atomic weapons. Um, the US drops atomic bombs on two Japanese cities, Hiroshima on August 6th of 1945, and Nagasaki three days later. These weapons are developed and these weapons are developed um, during the Manhattan Project, which lasts from 1945, 1942 to 1946, excuse me. Um, World War II ends in 1945. And when it ends, the United Nations is inaugurated in San Francisco. Uh, again, it's an international body. Its purpose is to keep order and peace, to maintain world peace. During World War II, the countries involved, the world's superpowers, begin shedding their, or, sorry, following World War II, um, the world's superpowers begin shedding their colonies all over the world. Um, this also leads to bloody civil wars um, all over third world countries and it sets the scene for geopolitical and ideological tensions of the cold war um, nearly all the colonial states from the superpowers of world war ii achieve independence um, in the period from 1945 to 1960 and they become um third world battlefields of the Cold War. So the Cold War seemingly, its, its dates are disputed among historians, um, but it, we can say for our purposes today, about 1947 to 1991, uh, following the end of World War II, the US and Russia or uh, the USSR, found themselves to be the leading world powers. And the Cold War is again a period of, it's a geopolitical tensions between these two powers, between the US with its uh, liberal and democratic allies and Russia, uh, sorry, the USSR, the United Soviet Socialist Republic um, alongside its communist bloc of allies. The US forms NATO the North American Treaty Organization. Uh, it's a military alliance. They form it in 1940, 1949. Um, and the USSR forms the Warsaw Pact in response in 1955. The Cold War and its effects on this period, I would say deserve to be its own lecture for two reasons. Uh, one, you can discover the root of um, today's war between Russia and Ukraine by looking at this. Uh, war. And then two, the Cold War affected everything, um, not least of which is ecumenical relations, because dialogue with the Russian church uh, for many decades is infiltrated by the KGB. Um, and note that the, just side note, the World Council of Churches is first formed in 1948 for the express purpose of 
ecumenism dialogue and Christian unity. Um, but it then becomes an arm or in the Cold War could become in certain uh, ecumenical dialogue could become an arm of um, uh, the US or, or the USSR. It, it's an interesting story. Um, anyway, the USSR is fine is dissolved finally in uh, after a, um, a gradual process. It's finally dissolved in December on December twentieth, nineteen ninety one. Um, it sought at for at least two or three years before that to reform itself politically and economically, adopting more liberal democratic values to prevent a period of political stalemate and economic back backslide. Um, and then the Cold War effectively ends with the dissolution of the USSR. So these wars, we have the world wars and the Cold War punctuate the 20th century um, and shows us just how humanity has rent itself from seeking the divine. Uh, I would even argue that this happens maybe not in our last lecture, but even the lecture before that, um, Andrew's lecture. Humanity wants to um, not seek communion with the divine. That's the, the end of the story. Um, and then how easily that communion or the rupture of that communion can easily rupture fraternity, which ironically was the slogan of the French Revolution, which we touched on in the last lecture. Um, so if we can change the slide, please. Thanks. Okay, so before we look at what's happening in the region, let's take a look at what's happening in the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church is really getting ready to throw itself into modernity, um, into the modern world, the modern secular world with what his Catholic historians call the most important religious event of the 20th century is Vatican II. Um, the Vatican II is an attempt by the Roman Catholic Church to engage in an increasingly secular society to quote unquote update the church. It's held at the behest of Pope John the 23rd uh, because again, he felt that the church needed updating which is a very interesting word to use when you're talking about churches. Uh, we're talking about apostolic church nonetheless. Um, the council first meets in 1962 and the last session is held in 1965. And a few of the updates include, if we're gonna look at three of the updates, liturgical movement, biblical movement, and ecumenical movement. So liturgical movement. Um, before Vatican II, liturgies were celebrated exclusively in ecclesiastical Latin. Um, which people had long stopped learning. So then people couldn't really participate in the prayers. And it was more like the people were watching the priest on a stage of sorts, you know, smiling at whatever's going on, not really like singing and participating. Um, so the council held that liturgy should be held in the languages of the people to get them to respond and sing congregation uh, responses. Another change is ushered in with Bible reading. Um, and this is very interesting. So um, your everyday Catholics, so not your theologians, not your clergymen, uh, not your monastic orders, um, in an attempt to distinguish themselves from Protestants, uh, didn't read the Bible. <laughs> so um, they were not familiar with Bible reading, personal Bible reading was not a um, a pillar of spiritual formation for um, your everyday Catholic Christian. Um, so, and fewer of them own personal copies. Uh, a family had a Bible and they'd put in like the important dates, you know, um, for the family and that was about it. Um, so to remedy this, the council started an initiative to have Catholics rediscover the Bible. So they printed Catholic translations with the missing deuterocanonical books um, that we, thank God, are familiar with today. Um, they encouraged personal reading and they, they taught that the Bible could ultimately be a wellspring of spirituality, if done in the right lens. So these initiatives make sure that they put the right Bibles 
um, in the hands of the Catholic parishioners. Another area that the council addresses is ecumenical dialogue. And because the movement was initially started again by Protestants for the unification of all Christians, uh, Catholics were very hostile to ecumenism. The only way Christians could be unified in the Catholic mind was if they came to Rome, if others come to Rome. Um, and just to note, I'm gonna go on a little bit of a tangent here. And um, this is something I talk about in my classes a lot. Um, we have to note that Rome historically has a very particular idea of unity, where involved parties are meant to conform themselves to the truth as defined by the center and the center is Rome. So it's not unity as defined by truth, it's the truth that is defined by Rome. Um, and if you do not agree with the truth as defined by Rome, you are in error and you are not a part of the church. Um, we see this historically in reconciliation attempts after the Council of Chalcedon. So we see this as early as the fifth century. Um, Rome has a certain reaction to Emperor Zeno's Himotikon. Um, we also see this in Rome declaring uh, war in the Crusades and how they treat the Eastern Christians in the Crusades. Um, and then we see this in the Council for our Florence where Rome attempts to um, orchestrate unity with all the Eastern churches. And then finally, we see it in the, um, in the pre-modern and the modern period with its attempt at unity with the Eastern churches. In our last lecture, we, I talked briefly about how the Coptic Catholic Church is established as late as 1895. Um, that's a late date for a church to be, an apostolic church to be established. Um, so anyway, back to Vatican II. Rome is hostile to ecumenism, right? Because there's a lot that they would have to give up. There's a lot of their um, theology that develops over, period, over a period of time. Um, but the council pronounces that Rome will uphold dialogue with non-Catholics. And officially, this is a big deal for the Catholic Church. Um, again, because dealing with non-Catholics was, didn't happen. It simply wasn't right. Um, I think the council is very significant for our purposes here today because we can see that Rome is trying to get its own house in order and it's slowly engaging, or at least being willing to engage with an increasingly secular society. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? All right, so next we're gonna talk about what is going on in the region in this period? So we're gonna back up a little bit to World War I, 1914, 1918. The Ottoman Empire's triumvirate. So it's, I want to, I think it's the Grand Vizier, the Minister of War and the head of the Navy or the Army, maybe the Army. Um, their names are Mehmet Talat Pesha, Ismail Enver Pesha and Ahmed Gemal Pesha use the guise of war to systematically rid the Anatolian or the East, um, the Eastern provinces of the Ottoman Empire, those in, in Asia, and the Arab provinces of the Ottoman Empire of its native Christian elements. So they did this in many ways. Uh, they did this via genocide and famine in with population exchanges and forced conversions. There's a very, um, it's, it's a system of forced Islamization of these elements. Um, we've all heard of the Armenian genocide, right? 1.5 um, Armenians are, sorry, excuse me, 1.2 Armenians are displaced or taken on death marches to the Syrian desert. Um, they're kidnapped, they're killed. A lot of young boys and girls were forcibly Islamized in different ways. So studies show that around 100,000 to 200,000 Armenian women and children are forced to convert to Islam and they're integrated into Kur uh, Kurdish and Turkish Muslim households. Um, that's not an insignificant number because today it's actually affecting 
I don't know how many, how many generations is that, like maybe four, three or four, um, that is affecting reconversion of these, of their children to the Armenian church today, um, the Armenian church in, in Turkey. About 800,000 to 1.2 million are displaced. Um, and 1.5 Armenians lose their lives um, in this period. And then sources contemporaneous with the Armenian genocide estimate that the surviving Armenian population um, after World War I was 200,000 out of about 2 million Armenian citizens of the Ottoman Empire. Um, Christians were cast as enemies of the state and Armenian Christians were considered the worst. They were considered the most, the, a permanent uh, enemy of the state, um, but also Pontic Greek and Assyrian Christians were targeted. Uh, Pontic Greek losses are estimated anywhere from 1 million to 1.6 million. Um, Aramaic speaking Christians were filed as Armenian Christians. So a lot of Assyrian Christians um, were considered also permanent enemies of the Young Turk party. Uh, we have about a quarter of a million Assyrian Christians are killed. Uh, the Syriac church's famous monasteries of Tur Abdin, Mardin, uh, Diyarbakir are looted, they're burned. Um, in the Arab provinces, there's a different approach we have here, especially in the Mount Lebanon region. The triumvirate um, orchestrate a severe famine. They focus in particular on the semi-autonomous uh, Mustasharifit of the Mount Lebanon region because the majority of Christians resided there. Um, the triumvirate, they, they bar crops from entering the region. And when that fails, they um, infest existing crops with locusts um, and they damage existing food supplies. An estimated about 200,000 Maronite Christians and Druze were starved to death in this period. Um, these men, these three men ruled the Ottoman Empire until its dissolution um, in 1922. So following World War I, the Ottoman Empire split up into spheres of influence between the allied powers, um, according to a secret treaty drawn up between France, Britain, and then Russia and Italy on one side. Um, Sykes-Picot was the agreement, which again was drawn, um, drawn up secretly in 1916. And then um, by 1922, it's like, okay, well, this is how we're gonna, um, split up the Middle East between British and French protectorates. Um, it's drawn up by Marc Sykes from the British side and uh, Francois-Georges Picot from the French side. And um, the Sykes-Picot agreement gives us our modern borders of the Middle East today. Um, these borders were drawn up in a way that protected the geopolitical interests of the allied powers, um, but they, um, they ran across tribal and religious affiliations, which is a grievance that modern day Islamists cite. So if you recall the video of the uh, 21 martyrs um, from Libya, the video of their beheading, um, the leader of, of the group of, of ISIS, what, the guy that's dressed in, uh, the guy that, that gives a long speech in the beginning of the video um, says that he's committing this act because it's retribution for Coptic involvement in the Crusades, which from history, you know, that Copts fought alongside Muslims against the Crusaders, so cool. Um, but also what Islam has suffered at the hands of Sykes-Picot, right? Because what Sykes-Picot does in the Islamic mind is that it, um, it gets rid of the last vestiges of a caliphate of Islamic rule. So for our purposes today, well, I want you to remember that, that Sykes-Picot is, um, is kind of the rallying cry for modern day Islamists. Um, for our purposes today, we're just gonna remember that the entire region is split up between the French 
and the British protectorates, which then affect in turn the culture and education and overall milieu of the burgeoning Arab countries. Okay, Palestinians revolt against the British protectorate of Palestine, um, and that becomes known as the um, Great Arab Revolt. Um, that lasts from 1936 to 1939. And this movement is important because it begins to ask questions about Arab identity and Arab nationalism. Um, it starts a movement on Arab nationalism, the, one that is free from former Ottoman or British or French influences, um, at the helm of which are many Christian thinkers. So at this point, being Arab or belonging to the Arab nation is not an exclusive characteristic of Islam or Muslims. Um, we can think back to the Arabi revolt in Egypt in 1882. The rallying, the rallying cry for that revolt was Egypt for the Egyptians, right? Um, which then the British found alarming and subsequently occupy Egypt until 1922. Um, citing regional stability for this long stay, of course. But um, 50 years later, other countries in the Middle East attempt to throw off British and French protectorates because, I mean, in the case of Palestine, they say Palestine for the Palestinians, you know, Jordan for the Jordanians. Um, so it's, it cites the same nationalistic sentiments we first heard in Egypt. Um, Egypt is a bit different than um, the than the rest of the Middle East at this time because Egypt was semi-autonomous, which we learned about from the the last lecture. Egypt has been a semi-autonomous um, state, or we could even call it pre-state, since 1805. Okay, other significant things that happen in the region are the creation of the state of Israel in 1948 following the atrocities the Jews faced in World War II, of course, and as a fulfillment of the 1917 Balfour Declaration, favoring the establishment of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. This is the first Jewish state in 2000 years, and it sparks the beginning of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, um, which is another conflict where each side has its geopolitical, each side has its geopolitical demands. Um, and it's a, it's a conflict that we still see happening today. Another significant date for this region is 1952, and that's the date of the Free Soldiers Revolution in Egypt. Um, and this marks the rise of Gamal Abdel Nasser's popularity. Uh, I believe he doesn't become president until 1954, 1956, one of those two. But he's becoming a public figure. Um, he's pretty much becoming the face of this revolution. And his charisma just kind of like the whole, the entire Middle East is just like eating this up. Um, this date is also significant because um, the revolution is the first time in modern history that Egypt or that Egyptians, native Egyptians rule Egypt. Um, at this time, Egypt is also a united Republic with Syria. Uh, this doesn't last very long under Gamal Abdel Nasser. Um, but the takeaway is that there's an emerging new pan-Arabism, uh, pan-Arab nationalism that rises. Um, it seeks to define, again, once again, what does it mean to be Arab? These questions are being asked again. But when we come to the 50s and 60s, these questions take on a more religious definition. Being Arab or being a, a pan-Arabism can't really be separated or teased away from Islam. It begins to look more towards Islam for a defining answer to this question of what is Arab identity, um, which eventually does not leave space for Christians. Um, event, and eventually it sparks uh, what we could, the rise or I mean the explosion even of Islamism in the 70s. Um, and how Islamism begins to dominate, absolutely dominate the conversation on identity in the region, which is again, something that we see today. Um, you will see if you take a trip to Egypt, you could see if you talk to your relatives in Egypt. Okay, can we go to the next slide, please? Oh, sorry, the slide after that. 
<laughs> Thank you. Okay, so let's take a look at what's happening in the Coptic Church at this time. Um, again, last time we didn't get the opportunity to discuss Patriarch Cyril IV, uh, the father of reform. He's Patriarch from 1854 to 1861. He does the most to propel the Coptic Church into the modern world. Um, he advocates education. And he founds um, schools at the Patriarchate with an emphasis in language studies and in Coptic. He advocates that the people study Coptic which has long been a dead language um, by this period. He opens schools for girls. He buys a printing press from Austria and has it paraded in the, in the rail, uh, from the railway station to the Patriarchate, has it processed, excuse me, he has it processed from the train to the Patriarchate um, with a lot of ceremony. Um, he's very concerned with the education of the clergy. He meets with them weekly he conducts um, systematic readings and theological discussions he himself attends bible classes offered by protestant missions in egypt um, he embraced the mode of education that evangelicals brought to egypt and he perpetrated it in the the great coptic or the patriarchal school he applies the evangelical approach to education um, and that's relevant for cops to participate in various new jobs and institutions that are evolving from Egypt's contacts with Europe. And he sets the tone for where the Coptic church is headed and how it enters into modernity. Subsequent patriarchs will only improve the, edu the educational institutions that serve the community, uh, not only in Egypt, but even they'll build on his efforts even in the diaspora. Um, so for the rest of our time together, I'm gonna to focus primarily on a few different areas. One is education and theological education. Um, two is politics and political involvement with the Egyptian state. And three is monasticism because that is the foundation of the church. It's monastic institutions feed the hierarchy. And so they currently have the power to define the patriarchate. Um, and four, I'm gonna talk about global presence, whether in ecumenism or the diaspora. So the next patriarch to bear the same name, um, Cyril V, he is the longest reigning leader of the Coptic church. He is a patriarch from 1874 to 1927. His 52 years on the throne witness an important milestone in modern theological developments. He opens a Coptic seminary in 1893. This new center for higher Christian learning is the first for the Coptic church since the catechetical school of Alexandria was active in late antiquity. Patriarch Cyril V opened three additional branches to further the education of priests and monks, one in Alexandria, the second in Bush, and the third in Deir el in Upper Egypt. Um, a certain priest, during Cyril V's tenure, we see the rise of a certain priest named Father Philotheos. He's a famous priest scholar who vehemently preaches against the Protestant missions. He taught the Coptic language and taught um, theology at the Cairo Seminary. And while he sees the proselytizing efforts of the Protestant missions, he works relentlessly to teach the Copts their own heritage. And he publishes religious educational material. Um, here we start to see the fruits of Cyril IV, Cyril V, Father Philotheos's efforts in that um, seminary alumni launch seven religious periodicals that contribute to a growing awareness among the Copts of their own theology between 1892 and 1907. Um, so you have seven different magazines putting out um, educational content for your everyday Copt. Okay. So after Father Philotheos, let's talk a little bit, we're gonna take a little bit of a detour into politics, just a little bit. Um, let's take a look at a very important event that changes the tone of sectarian tensions 
in the 20th century. So during Patriarch Cyril V's tenure, Boutrous Ghali Besha serves as Prime Minister of Egypt from 1908 to 1911. This is a big deal for the Copts, right? No, none of them have ever been Prime Minister. Um, there have been Previously, there have been Christian prime ministers of Egypt, but those were Armenian Christians. Um, so this is the first time a Copt has this, this honor, right? Um, or not this honor. It's the first time a Copt serves this office. Um, at this time, Copts are politically involved in Egypt's administration. Um, they're about 7% of the population, um, but they hold about 25% of the nation's wealth. Um, they control about 60% of Egyptian commerce and they are found in all the professions and government services. Um, they are craftsmen, they're found in the peasantry. And it could possibly be said that the Copts were leading Egypt into the future. So they are by no means a community to be overlooked in Egypt in this period. They are ready to take important steps into the modern world of nation states, one that has is increased in technology and industrialization and a world, they're, they're ready to engage in a world with aggressive Western culture and values and the world market. The Dinshawi incident of 1906 is a hunting accident that kills a British soldier. And while an Egyptian villager tends to the victim, the shot soldier, the villager is blamed for his death for the soldier's death. Now, cops would suffer the most from this deadly encounter between Britain and Egypt. Um, this explosive incident would mark the reactivation of the Islamic versus Christian dimension of the Egyptian question, in that the judgment and the sentencing were presided over by Boutrous Khali Besha, um, who lived, by the way, from 1846 to 1910. So while he serves as prime minister, he's appointed prime minister in 1908, um, his position conflated the cops with the unpopular British administration in the eyes of you know, the rest of the Egyptians. Um, he presides over this case. He's killed in 1910. He's assassinated. Um, because his, the Egyptian media at the time um, really, really conflated his office with the British administration. They were basically, um, you know, newspaper articles were being printed left and right about how the cops brought in the British and how the, it's in, um, it's to Coptic advantage or the advantage of the Copts that the British are um, occupying Egypt. So he's assassinated in the middle of the proceedings of, um, of the Dinshawi incident. His assassination results in a meeting called the Coptic Congress of Asyut the following year, 1911. Um, and that's called for by Metropolitan Macarius of Asyut, who lives from 1897 to 1944. This meeting was set to discuss the antagonism between the Christians and Muslims, um, but it was against the bushes of the patriarch. The patriarch thought it would just cause more trouble. Um, he's concerned that a large gathering of cops would result in further like agitation of the situation. So the Congress meets to ensure that the rights of the cops are, um, are in the forefront here. The demands include Sunday as an official holiday for the Copts, um, employment based on merit and equality between Christians and Muslims and high ranking leadership positions and the Christian religion to be taught in schools to Christian students. A month later, a counter-Islamic Congress met in Ain Shams with a total of 5,000 attendees, um, where most of the Coptic Congress's requests are refuted. 
Nevertheless, this is the first time the issue of Coptic rights becomes a point of debate, of debate, and the full citizenship of Copts is asserted. Now, the early 20th century um, proved an eventful season for Coptic participation in Egyptian politics. Cops of all backgrounds are involved, not just within the church, but especially without, so not through the church. Um, in the second half of the 20th century, which is where we're, we'll end the lecture, um, you'll see a dramatic turn in the relationship between the church and state. Um, if we go back to the late 18th century, we see the rise of Coptic archons, right? Of, um, we could even call them paragons of the community, right? Who are able to engage the state on a secular basis, not on a religious basis. Um, and then we, Cops gained full citizenship in the early 19th century. Um, and then again, in the mid 19th century when the jizya is abolished in 1865, um, the remnants of the Coptic millet system and consequently the sole authority of the patriarch as the representative of the community is challenged in the first part of the 20th century. Um, the late 20th century, early 21st century, the authority of the patriarch is sole representative of the community returns. So we have a, a sort of neo-millet system. The, the pendulum swings again into, um, if you wanna deal with the cops or if the state wants to deal with the cops, it's gonna deal with the cops uh, in the, the person of the patriarch. The crux of these tensions, um, I would like to place in the patriarchate of Yusab II, Pope Yusab II, who is patriarch, let's see, he's patriarch 116, I think. No, 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 115. Yeah, 115. Um, he's patriarch from 1947 to 1958. Um, because in his patriarchate is where you really see a tension between um, does the patriarch hold all of the, is he the sole political voice of the Copts or not? Or are they allowed to have a voice outside of the church? Is it allowed to be varied? Um, there's plenty of sources available on him. Um, so, you know, should you choose to do some background reading on him, it is readily available. Um, there's one more political story that I find intriguing um, that I do wanna share with you because it's something that we don't typically see. Um, or maybe pay attention to. And it definitely, if we're talking about themes of, you know, history being theology and, and psychology, I think it brings these all together. Um, so as we said, World War I started in 1939, Hitler invades Poland, it ends in 1945. Since the world, the war's outbreak in 1939, Hitler's armies subjected nation after nation to Nazi rule. They're just like flying through, um, taking over everybody. Britain staved off disaster at Dunkirk and prevented outright invasion in the Battle of Britain, but there's little else to show for three years of death and sacrifice. The Soviet Union was invaded in 1941 and it almost collapsed within three months, um, but just managed to stop the Germans at the gates of Moscow while holding out in the ruins of Stalingrad. Even when Hitler's Italian allies were repulsed, German forces came to their aid and finished off the opposition, notably in Greece, and wanted to do the same in North Africa. They're set to do the same in North Africa. Nazis want to take over North Africa. Um, so by July of 1942, German and Italian forces under Erwin Rommel swept through the desert and were closing in on Alexandria uh, the headquarters of the British army and the Greek royal government in exile. So July, we have the first battle of Al Alamein. Um, the Germans are stopped by British forces, which include Australia's 9th Division, um, but there's still no victory. By October 1942, under the command of Bernard Montgomery, uh, a massive Allied counterattack was being prepared. 
According to an eminent Egyptian medical specialist and professor at Cairo University, Dr. Nagib Mahfouz, Montgomery told him that before the Battle of Al Alamein broke out, he saw in a dream the battle raging between two camps and a man pointed with his hands. The more he made this movement, the more the German forces were defeated. So he continues pointing until they're completely defeated. And then when asked about the man's name, Montgomery replied, Mina. Um, also take note of like where this is happening. This is happening outside of Alexandria, El Alamein is close to the ruins of the city of Abu Mina. Um, at this decisive battle, a Greek brigade is brought into action. These soldiers had refused to surrender to Hitler's forces and Hitler's forces despised them and their religion. So from this interaction, Egypt's Coptic Christians knew what would happen to them if Egypt comes under Nazi rule. So during the first night of engagement at midnight, according to the Coptic sanctuary um, of St. Mina, St. Mina intervented to uh, put an end to the complete destruction of El Alamin. Um, at midnight, many of the pious people saw the saint leading camels as in his icon to the German camp. It was difficult to describe the terror that struck the Germans who were undefeated until this time. In that hour, Hitler's authority ended as the troops retreated. German and Italian forces suffered heavy losses. They had to withdraw. They never recovered from this initiative. Uh, the victory granted or guaranteed, excuse me, the safety of Egypt and it lifted allied morale. The Russian victory at Stalingrad came a little later in early um, 1943. As for the faithful, um, I think what's really interesting here is that we, we know that St. Mina's feast day or his, his main feast day is November 24th, um, which seems to correspond nicely to the date uh, the Battle of al Alamein comes to the conclusion, which is November 11th of 1942. So um, that's just a cool little, you know, where the unseen meets the seen in human history. Um, let's head back a little bit to theological education. Uh, Archdeacon Habib Girgis serves as the seminary second dean from 1918 till his death in 1951. He breathes new life into his curriculum. He observes similar institutions in Europe and he further adopts programs like practical liturgical training and he adapts those into a Coptic setting for his Coptic students. He also inaugurates night classes about 1945 to accommodate students and professionals who want to take on holy orders. The modern Coptic papacy expands upon these initial efforts. So later on in 1954, the Institute of Coptic Studies is established, continues even to this day to teach, research and promote aspects of Coptic civilization and heritage. A bishopric of education, as well as the higher council for education was inaugurated during Cyril the sixth tenure, which lasted from 1959 to 1971. The establishment of a Coptic seminary after centuries of supposed dormancy and subsequent availability of educational theological materials uh, was the results of the church strengthening her people against encroaching mission movements in Egypt, against encroaching Protestant mission movements in Egypt. Um, the Coptic church responded in ways that would not only keep her ancient faith alive, but would also allow it to thrive for future generations. But they could take the approach and learn from it like we see at the um, in the Sunday school movement much like Patriarch the fourth Patriarch Cyril the fourth's great Coptic school and how he employs Protestant religious education methods to ancient Coptic theology um, the Sunday school movement kind of does the same it makes biblical and liturgical education widely available the result was a renewed interest in their roots and the tradition for the Copts. Through a non-traditional conduit through which Egyptian Christianity grew in, in fever, right? This laity-led movement remains very much alive today in Coptic parishes around the world. 
the Holy Synod signed its approval to Archdeacon Habib Skirgis's idea of Sunday school um, to revive religious education among Copts in 1898. By 1935, the General Committee of Sunday School had 85 branches um, throughout Greater Cairo. Students numbered more than 10,000 boys and girls from all educational levels. And this movement bore much fruit for reform in the church because figures like Pope Shenouda III, um, monastic reformer and prominent theologian uh, Abu Nubat al Miskin, and the future Bishop of Social and Ecumenical Services, uh, Bishop Samuel, were involved in the movement during their youth. So these three went on to leave a deep imprint on the Coptic church. The Sunday school movement grows in junction with the Coptic church as a whole. So churches in the diaspora today implement the model as a mode of religious education for parishioners' children. Um, as we'll see, you know, in the, the waves of uh, immigration to uh, Australia, Canada, the United States, the UK, uh, later on Europe, later on in South America. Um, there's a loose centralization of the curriculum that allows participants all over the world to discover um, this shared Christian heritage. And it allows cops to place themselves at the stage of world Christianity. Um, it helps them again to better, better know themselves and then be able to better relate um, ecumenically even. So while bo bolstering theological education, inaugurating seminaries, creating um, popular Sunday school movements, cops are able to establish an awareness of their theological tradition. Um, and this knowledge provides the tools with which to participate in the ecumenical movement. Um, Modernization also aids the emergence of the Coptic church as ecumenically conscious, um, and it allows it to have a global presence. During the, uh, the reign of Patriarch Yusam II, the Coptic church joins the World Council of Churches uh, in its earliest days. It becomes a full member in 1954. I think that's on the next slide. If I'm not mistaken. Oh, no, sorry. Let's, let's go back. My bad. So in addition to becoming a member of the World Council of Churches, the Coptic Church also becomes involved in the All Africa Conference of Churches, which was formed in 1963. This brings us to the Patriarchate of Cyril the Sixth. Sorry, next slide for real this time. <laughs> okay. So again, he's Patriarch from 1959 to 1971. He completely transforms the church through prayer and through living out an Orthodox ethos. Those are his, those are his, uh, Those are his tools of reform, okay? For one, he's a pivotal figure in the recent revival of monasticism, just two generations before ours. Um, in his early days, monasticism, so before he goes to the monastery, monasticism is for the uneducated, the unmarriable, and the unsuccessful. So his own family bemoaned his decision to become a monk because they told him that he was none of those things. Um, but he was insisting on living out the ethos and then wherever he was and he inspired others to do the same. Um, he disciples many of the prominent fathers who become significant leaders in the church. Um, again, Father Shenouda, or sorry, Pope Shenouda, and Abu Nameta, Meskin, Abu Nabshoi Kamen, Father Louis Sideros, so we know. Um, well, Abu Nabat al was a disobedient disciple. Um, he also helped launch an unrivaled monastic uh, institution that centers on education. Tamov Irini, 
helps launch a women's monastic revival centered on the Pacomian rule. So Patriarch Cyril VI works um, tirelessly to restore monasteries, not even during his patriarchal tenure, but before. Um, he works to inhabit them, to make them habitable, um, to bolster their ranks, but he also works to make them beautiful. Um, Pope Shenouda III then continues this tradition. He ultimately changes the relationship that the cops have to monasteries, right? So to think just maybe, just maybe three generations ago, three generations ago, you know, nobody went to the monastery and unless you, you had to be like an undesirable society to go to the monastery, but now monasteries have, um, you know, requirements. You have to be educated. Uh, to be a monk now. And then also on the flip side of that, which is something you'll see if any of you take a short trip to Egypt, you head to a monastery, you'll see they're not only centers of prayer, they're important centers of commerce, right? And they're important social centers as well, which is something that, you know, we didn't have a couple of generations ago. Um, this all starts with Pope Cyril VI. Now, allow me another spirituality comes into human history tangent. Um, 1968, during his tenure, the Virgin Mary appears atop of the Cairo church in Zaytun. Uh, the... Oops. Sorry about that. Um, the Virgin Mary appears on top of a uh, church in Zaytun. The apparitions last for three years. There are few interpretations that relate this um, apparition to the Six Day War of 1967. Um, Egypt's involved because I, uh, the state of Israel, the newly minted state of Israel, takes, for, um, takes from Egypt the Sinai, right? Takes from Syria the Golan Heights. Um, that it captures Sinai and in their defense of the peninsula, um, many people lose their, their young sons to this war. So people interpreted this apparition as you know, the mother consoling mothers for their loss. Um, other aspects of Pope Cyril's tenure is ecumenical dialogue. And he prepares the Coptic church for the global scene. Um, and for a modern take on the Oriental Communion, which Egypt's Coptic Church was historically the leader. Um, and, and he does this through friendship with the emperor of Ethiopia, Haile Selassie. Um, Haile Selassie and Pope Cyril uh, worked out the autocephaly of the Ethiopian church shortly after Cyril um, starts his patriarchate in 1959. Um, this effort is, was previously blocked by the Egyptian state because of the relationship, the historical relationship between the Coptic and Ethiopian churches was a prestigious asset to the Egyptian state. Um, and that it meant it could exercise influence and push for its interests outside official conduits of diplomacy. Pope Cyril granted the Ethiopian Church again, autocephaly 1959. And this is significant because it's the first time an Ethiopian patriarch leads the Ethiopian Church. Um, in 1965, Haile Selassie had Pope Cyril preside over the meeting of the Oriental Churches in Addis Ababa. Um, and interestingly enough, this is the first time a Coptic patriarch travels in a plane, um, you know, blessings of the modern period. Um, a lot of scholars say that this is the first meeting. You'll hear this a lot. They say it's the first meeting of the Oriental churches since the Council of Chalcedon, and that's simply not true. Um, the heads of the Oriental churches met. They corresponded. They were in contact all throughout the medieval and pre-modern periods. Nonetheless, this conference in 1965 is very important because it sets the tone for how the Oriental church is going to engage the modern world. Um, Pope Cyril's tenure also saw the first moves for the Coptic diaspora with his blessing Coptic parishes in Australia, Canada, the UK, the US um, are first established. Um, he wasn't able to visit his children abroad. He was called home in 1971, but that was something that, that Pope Shenouda did. He was the first patriarch to do that, to um, 
visit a diaspora congregation. Now his tenure is initially marked with hostility uh, with the state where Pope Cyril VI is friends with Gamal Abdel Nasser, um, Pope Shenouda and Sadat's relationship could be called anything but friendly. Uh, the Pope was accused of fomenting support for attempting to create a Coptic state within Egypt uh, because he spoke out against the rise of Islamism, against fundam fundamentalist Islam and its effects on Egyptian culture. Remember that I think he was born in the 20s, so 20s or 30s. So in his lifetime or during his lifetime, um, what it meant to be an Arab changed drastically. So he's, he's grappling with now in the 70s and 80s, what it means to be an Arab is very different than what it meant when he was a younger man. Um, a rupture in understanding led to Pope Shinra's house arrest in the Monastery of St. Bishoy from 1981 to 1983. He only returned to public life after Sadat's death. Um, and he was right about the rise of fundamentalist Islam because attacks against Christians became more frequent and intense, which we can all attest to. Um, again, there's a lot on Pope Shenouda. It's quite recent. So I'm gonna end the lecture here. Um, but I do wanna say that the 20th century is a surprising period for the Copts. They start, you know, their political power, they're in excellent economic standing. Um, the cultural influences kind of close in on them as a community, but nonetheless, this period is marked by education. It's marked by improving their house, getting their own house together, and then creating a global presence. Um, I remember growing up that um, in the West, nobody knew what the Coptic church was when I was younger. Um, I had to be like, yeah, I'm Coptic Orthodox is kind of like the Greek church, you know? Um, but now everyone knows Egypt's Coptic church and the plight of Egypt's Christians. But they also know their faithfulness um, and their vitality of faith, despite bleak surrounding culture. Um, so I just kind of want to rattle off a few titles uh, to share for further reading. Um, one is A Silent Patriarch, which I want to say was published in 2019 by St. Vladimir's Press. Um, I would encourage you to read this book once, twice, three times. Um, I know it's a little daunting. It's 600 pages, but um, I promise they go by quickly. And I promise it's a very enjoyable read. Um, that is on the tenure of Cyril VI. Um, another book I would like to recommend is... Um, the Popes of Egypt by American University of Cairo Press. Um, that's an excellent resource on um, recent, recent church history too. And then a third is um, a book called Habib Gerges, A Light for, I forget what the subtitle is, but it's, it's about Habib Gerges, it's by Bishop Sorio, um, easily available on Amazon. Um, and that, tells you a lot, not only about theological education and how it becomes available for your everyday Copt, but um, it also speaks to the tensions between, you know, within the church and the, um, how the different ideologies are, are teased out. Um, that's also an excellent resource as well. Uh, thank you for having me with you today. Thank you for rescheduling, being so accommodating. Um, it's very kind. And um, yeah, I'd be happy to take on any questions.